I want to talk about a uh, small solution for major problems. Okay? So we start with the first one, which you're probably familiar with. Global warming, big one, right? I promise big ones. And actually our friend Al Gore highlighted the villain of the story, right there on the cover of his book and of his movie, Power Plants. You see the smokestacks? Coal burning power plants are responsible for over 30 to 40% of CO2 emissions. Now, everybody acknowledges that it's bad, and we meet in Copenhagen from one to time to time to kind of talk about it, but no one wants to write the check to solve the problem. Problem number one, let's call it clean air. Problem number two has to do with oil. And I would say there's a gap. There's a gap between countries that own oil to the countries that use oil. What the first group has in common is that democracy is not one of their strongest sides. Okay? Uh, I have a friend, Galuf, who wrote a book. He named his book Making Oil a Salt. And the idea was that once upon a time, salt was a strategic asset. <laughs> because this was the only way that you could preserve meat. The expression salt of the earth, the word in English salary comes from salt. People were paid in salt. Salt was strategic. And all of a sudden, technology came, refrigeration, and we find other ways to preserve our food. So salt is great, but salt is not longer a strategic asset. Now, let's get back to fuel and think about it for a minute. So let's call problem number two renewable energy. Problem number three is something that most of you are probably less familiar with. It has to do with sustainability of feed and food. And I will uh, give the example of the aquaculture industry just to illustrate this, uh, this problem. About half of the fish in the world are cultured in big pans in the oceans. So if you grow fish, you need to feed them. So what do you feed fish with? Small fish. It sounds like a great idea, but the problem, actually there are two problems. So problem number one is, and you can ask the fishermen right uh, around the corner here, the humankind has killed all the little fish. There was an article in the Time magazine not long ago, <coughs> the title was Oceans of Nothing. We just killed all the little fish in order to feed the big fish. So if you have an anchovy, don't put it in your pizza, put it in your safe and lock it, because this thing is going to be valuable. Okay, go on. The second problem of feeding big fish with small fish is, small fish have a lot of mercury, and PCBs, and heavy metals, and drugs, and everything that floats in the ocean. So guess what's happening to the big fish when they eat the small fish? Not a nice idea to think about. Now, the reason you use the small fish to feed the big fish is because there's one essential thing that we can only get from, from the little fish, which is omega-3s. It's the same reason that we sometimes use food supplements as omega-3s, right? How many of you use omega-3s here? Lovely. You know where your omega-3 comes from? The same fish oil that I mentioned a second ago. Ladies and gentlemen, eating omega-3s from fish oil is like drinking water that was purified from sewage. Maybe pure, but yucky to think about it. <laughs> okay, so food sustainability is a big issue. That's problem number three. So I promise big problems. Here they are. <laughs> the second thing I promise is a small solution. A very small one. I want to show you the solution. What I'm doing now, taking one drop and I'm putting it on my hand. Okay? Teeny tiny. You can hardly see it. You can see nothing, right? Okay, so pretend to have a microscope. If you had a microscope, that's what you would see. Algaes. Algaes are extremely cute. These are swimming plants, ladies and gentlemen. These are the heroes of the story. They have a small mustache, they swim around, they belly dance for you. And these little creatures are responsible for half of the oxygen we breathe. So take a deep breath. Half of this came from algaes in the ocean. They are doing one thing that all plants are doing, but algaes are the champions. It's called photosynthesis. Okay, so these little creatures double their mass every couple of hours. Imagine your tree in the backyard doubling its mass every couple of hours. Crazy to think about, right? That's what they do. 
So the beauty, one of the beauties of algae is they do not use fertile land, they do not need fresh water, and they grow like crazy. When you put them into CO2 environment, they're happy. You think it's poison or greenhouse, greenhouse gases, or all the names we humans attach to CO2, they think it's gourmet food. They're happy. Okay, give me some more. Because actually half of their body weight is carbon coming from eating the suit. So you remember problem number one, right? Here is a natural platform to deal with CO2 emissions. Now let's consider the alternatives. The alternative is a technology that has an interesting name. It's called sequestration, but a very stupid application. What sequestration means is we're going to take the gases coming out of the smokestacks or power plants, like Khadera, okay? And we're going to separate the CO2 out. We're going to get pure stream of CO2 out of it. This is an energy intensive and expensive process, but nevertheless, okay, now I have a pure stream of CO2. And then I'm going to hide it. <laughs> Where? Under the carpet. Okay? I'm going to hide the CO2 in geological reservoirs somewhere. I'm going to make it disappear. You do not fool Mother Nature. Okay? So what happens if these megatons of highly concentrated CO2 percolate? Okay? What's happening? It's a cloud of invisible toxic gas. CO2 in high concentration is toxic. And it's heavier than air. So it's a blanket of death moving towards the next city, killing millions of people. That's the alternative to algae. Okay? So problem number one, as I promised, is a big one. The beauty about this solution, it's not only that that's the natural solution to CO2, you have a product. You're <coughs> making something out of CO2. How valuable is this something that you're making? So I take an algae. That's an algae food. Okay? And I'm going to separate it to compounds. I'm going to take the oil separately and the protein milk separately. Now I have two products. One is oil, algae oil, and one is a protein milk. Let's talk about this one first. I visited in China about a week ago, and I met with the CEO of PetroChina. It's a $500 billion company. And I asked the CEO to tell me where oil comes from. He was shocked. He said, from the ground. So yet, what was it before? Organic material. I said, which organic material? He said, dinosaurs? I said, uh -huh. <laughs> it was algae. So algae oil is the fuel that we're using every day, unless we're driving a better place car. <laughs> okay? But algae oil is the way we live. This is very ancient algae oil, but it is algae oil. So making fuel out of algae oil that's exactly the way we do it. You can do it in refineries or in biodiesel conversions. That's a legit, or legit fuel. Now, the beauty about it, you do not have to change the infrastructure. You can live your life as you used to live. You can drive the same car, the same airplane, the same ship, the same everything. You don't have to change infrastructure. How big it is? Huge. Okay? So that's the oil side of things. Now let's get back to this. Remember what this is? protein meal and omega-3s. Now I'll tell you a secret. The reason that little fish have omega-3s in them is not because they produce omega-3s. Fish do not produce them. Fish accumulate them from eating oh, algae. Please. You got it. Okay, <laughs> great. Yeah. Okay, so algae are the source of omega-3 on this planet. So skip the middle man. Fit fish with algae, right? So, the only problem with this narrative is the fact that it's too good to be true, right? Why wasn't it done before, Isaac? If everything is so lovely, that's a natural way, if you have a product, why wasn't it done before? Two reasons, okay? It was never done before. <laughs> this was the first one. Now, you have to tell an Israeli it was never done before, now you got his attention. Okay? You're talking to me? <laughs> we don't take no for an answer this time. That's how we do it. So at the time I was an MIT scientist. I had a, the first system in the world to convert CO2 from a power plant into biofuels and feed. And I realized I had to put the technology in a real framework, in a real power plant. 
So I wore my, my tie and I jumped on a plane and I landed, landed in Phoenix, Arizona, drove another two hours to the middle of the desert as a power plant and a meeting with a power, power plant manager, of course, with short pants and short sleeves. And I'm with my suit and my tie and a weird accent coming from my teeth. And I'm telling him about, you know, the CO2 that's going to feed his algae and make all these products and fuel. And I said, what, what, what? That's biology, right? He said, yes, we don't do it here. And I have a meeting in two minutes, I'm sorry. And he just walks away. <laughs> this could have been the end of this venture. But remember, I'm Israeli, right? I don't take no for an answer. So I said, uh, excuse me, sir. In the cooling towers that you have outside here, you have this kind of green slime that's growing there. I was like, yeah, you see, you have biology. Actually, these are algae. You're already growing them. Let's just make something useful out of them. So he's now my best friend. Every time he comes to the power plant, the first thing he does is going to the algae project to see how the algae are doing. But the fact that it was not done before was a non-starter. It wasn't done before. Wow, so maybe we shouldn't do it. The second reason that uh, it's not a reality today has to do with the existing uh, infrastructure of producing algae. People produce algae today, as we speak. Even in Israel, you're allowed, there's two commercial factories that grow algae for cosmetics. So today, algae are food for the rich. Okay, so how can you take something that's very, very high value and make it into commodity? Isaac, I don't believe you. And I say, I'm not going to build a cement fl uh, plant the way you do a pharmaceutical plant. I'm going to build a cement plant the way you build cement plants. What you see here is a thousand megawatt power plant in Arizona. You see the smoke stuck in the background. And what you see there is, looks like plastic bags and greenhouses. Looks like farming, right? Well, you are. You are an energy farmer. That's what you do. And it should look like a farm. Okay, so technology has solutions. I think the major things to think about when you design a new technology, you have to think about three major things. One, has to be scalable. Energy is big. How big? Let me give you an example. One corn field that supports one ethanol production facility in the United States is 100 square kilometers, 10 by 10. That's big, right? That's energy for you. So you have to think big. If you have a lot of water loss or something, you can never grow big. The second thing you have to think about is being sustainable. You cannot, for instance, use more energy than, than you produce, right? Your energy balance should be kind of positive. And the third thing, and which I think is the most important thing, it has to make money. Why? Because that's how it will become a part of our life. Okay, so economical viability is king. That's so just the way we live. So if you have all these three together, you created a huge value that could become a reality. I'll tell you why I'm very optimistic. I'm very optimistic <coughs> because I see that we live in a in time of change. Now, I know that, uh, yes, we can sound Obamish, <laughs> but we invented it. We're there first, right? <laughs> um, because I'll give you the analog. The analog is food. Once upon a time, our ancestors were all hunters, gatherers, right? That's what we did. We, we gathered the food and we killed the next by mammoth and that's how we survived. And all of a sudden, we decided to be a farming society. Now, farming society is not something trivial because you have to work hard, you have to pray for rain, maybe, you know, sometimes it doesn't work. That's a hard thing to do. But nevertheless, that's how we live our life today. We cannot think about life without being a farming society and farming change our attitude to water and resources and land and we sit in the same place for a long time, right? That's how we live. What are we in terms of fuel? We're hunters and gatherers. We see a pile of fuel, we stick a straw, we drain it, and I want to see someone that will not let me do it. Huh? Okay, that's what we are. But I see a change, and the change is we're starting to grow energy crops. Okay, Brazil made it with sugarcane. America did it with corn. There's one little problem with corn. We kind of eat it as well. <laughs> so you driving, for you to drive your green car, someone has to starve. Not such a great idea, right? So although the first attempt was painful, I think we came to a point of no return. I think we are going to be energy farmers. 
that's going to be part of life. And hopefully when my children will fill the car with gasoline, they're going to ask, where was it cultured? Okay? <laughs> Just part of life. So I'm, I think we're very fortunate in doing this. And it also reminds me of uh, you know, the meeting between Moses and God. Do you remember the first time Moses met God, God had to make a very good impression. Because God, God was about to ask Moses something very hard, like take the people of, of, of Israel out of Egypt. That's a hard thing to do. And especially, you know, he had a great life. Why bother doing it? So God wanted to make a very good impression. And he's God, remember? So he can do anything. He can do a flying elephant. He can do what? He can do anything. God decided to appear as a burning bush. Now, you remember what was surprising? The bush was burning and not consumed. What's burning and not consumed? Renewable energy, right? Renewable energy, right? So what's the divine message here? Don't do corn ethanol. Right? If you want to grow energy crops, you don't do it when you grow your food crops. That's a different thing. You do it in the desert. And that's when Israel shines. We, ladies and gentlemen, know how to culture things in the desert better than anyone in the world. I just only, are only one example. I'll give you another example. In order to culture energy crops, you need to be able to use water in a wise way. Israel recycles its water. Israel is number one in the world in recycling water. In fact, Israel recycles over 70% of its water, number one in the world. Number two, Spain, 12%. So Israel is a true leader in water recycling, which is one of the things you need to think about if you want to go towards growing energy crops. So I feel very fortunate that we live at this time, and I feel very fortunate to be in this place. And um, I hope that Israel would lead this green revolution so... This will become a reality. Adjacent to every power plant, you'll have an algae farm. You just won't need the smokestack. Because all the CO2 will go to feeding algae. So fill it up with seaweed, because that's our freedom. And it's literally green. <laughs>